thank you so much. Um, what an amazing group of speakers to follow, and I don't feel remotely um, nervous or concerned about living up to the other presentations. But um, it's so great to be at an event that takes on these important issues but gives us so many kind of tools and tactics because um, as Martin Kager Smith said at the beginning, you know, questioning the status quo, quo is, is one thing and, and very important, but initiating systemic change is not uh, always so easy to figure out. So I'm, I'm really grateful for the kind of um, tactics and strategies that have been shared today. Um, what I'm going to present is something much, much smaller scale, much, um, much more modest in terms of uh, sort of budget and so on. But I think um, I hope you'll see that it's it's a project that has evolved um, because it's answered a certain need amongst those who've um, participated in it for something which is which is rather different to what museums tend to do so well, which is of course deal with objects, deal with um, uh, short uh, short term encounters. Um, and uh, deal with spectacle. And so I'm going to talk about a reading group that I initiated uh, for over four years ago. And I originally only intended to run a couple of sessions at Goldsmiths where I teach. Um, but so many people felt that they were getting something from this kind of um, intimate way of meeting that we've continued for four years. And we meet every, every month. Um, and we meet uh, on a regular date, and I think it's become a place for a kind of sustained uh, commitment to um, exploring feminisms outside the Anglo-American canon in a way which is, um, which is sort of intimate and um, quite vulnerable, as I hope I will show. Um, it's done in the context of art, although often what we talk about isn't art. Most of us come from an art background, curators, artists, researchers, and so on. Quite a few people are new to this city. And in fact, when I set it up, I had recently moved back to the UK, having been away for 12 years. So it's also been a place where people have found friendship and a sense of kind of knowing that you're going to be in a feminist context. Um, I think has been has been really important. Um, so what we do is uh, we we go we 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 re we revisit or encounter feminisms, as I said, from outside the Anglo-American canon. We originally started by looking at Italian feminisms. I had done quite a lot of research into feminist art and culture, but had found very, very little on the Italian feminist movement, which um, the more I started to learn about it, the more kind of shocked I was, really, by my own ignorance. So I set up the group as a place stemming from ignorance. Um, why don't I know about this? And how can I find a space to explore it with other people? Um, and from an initial first year, primarily focused on the feminisms of Italy, we've developed other kind of intersectional inquiries, sometimes around sort of regional perspectives, Arab world, China, Korea, and sometimes taking um, a look at other kinds of, I guess, um, radical feminisms, feminisms that um, do not seek to assimilate into the mainstream, but that seek to change it. Um, so here are some pictures from some of our meetings. Uh, about a year and a half ago, no, actually, was it just last year, last summer, actually, we started alternating between meeting in an art space and meeting in a home. So you can see this was one of our first um, Saturday lunches where we get together and cook and then read and drink and then read a bit more and eat. Um, we spent about four hours together on these Saturdays. Um, and then the outside one was a small meeting as part of the anti-university. Um, we've met out, we've met at different spaces inside London, um, as well as sometimes going outside London. Bottom left was in Penzance. This is our current sort of program. We're off to Bex Hill on Saturday to do a session of deep listening. Um, so this will not be a reading. Well, we will read. We'll read one another's writing um, based on our experiences that we narrate to one another and, and then write in response to what we hear about forms of gender resistance. Um, 
and this was our first year where, as I say, we were, were really engaged with Italian feminisms. Um, Italian feminisms gave us tools, um, particularly around uh, collectivity. Um, one of the reasons Italian feminism isn't very well known outside Italy, and in fact, not necessarily well known in Italy, well, there's the problem of translation and the arrogance of the Anglophone culture. Um, but also, those, those feminist groups in Italy aren't really, they're, they're very devoted to their collective practices and they've, they've developed really um, sophisticated forms of being together. Um, they talk about starting from the self, they practice forms of consciousness raising that they call autocogienza. They believe that it is only by looking at one's own place and trying to understand the stereotypes that we've inherited and inhabit and perpetuate, and by trying to break those habits, that real change can occur. And they're very concerned with nurturing the relationships of those that they meet with regularly. And in fact, I'll show you some slides in a minute. A group of us were just in Milan over the weekend visiting some of these collectives and really getting a sense of this kind of very long-term commitment to feminist intergenerational relationships. Um, we, um, members of the reading group, at the end of our first year, put on a public program which was in dialogue with Italian feminisms, trying to make them relevant, trying to think what can we get from this, these movements of the 70s and 80s for now. So we were looking at their rejection of an equal rights kind of feminism, saying no, it's not enough to be included. Um, as one of the feminist groups say, inclusion is what's offered, offered to col colonized people. We have to change the rules. We were interested in Carla Lonzi, who's one of the key figures, uh, the founder of Revolta Femminile. She had been an art critic. She rejected art criticism as inauthentic. At a certain point, she, she rejected um, meeting in groups with men. At a certain point, she rejected feminist leadership, feeling that that was ossifying as well. So we were very interested in these kinds of strategies of res resistance and withdrawal that sometimes um, it's necessary to step away. So these were some of the touchstones for the Now You Can Go program. Um, when we started out, and I, I called it the Feminist Duration Reading Group, I was thinking about this essay by Amelia Jones where she talks about the work of queer feminist duration and, and the kind of work involved in bringing um, movements, struggles, art, and writing from the past into the present. So there's this real interest in a kind of embodied way of doing this. Uh, it's kind of linked to uh, re-performance strategies. So one of the things we do in the group is we read out loud. We don't expect people to read the texts beforehand. In fact, um, I realized quite early on that that was putting off lots of people. I'd get these kind of frantic texts 10 minutes before the meeting going, you know, I wanted to come, but I didn't have time to do the readings. So now we have this, this format of just reading as we go around the room. And even though that was adopted quite strategically, just to sort of let people off the hook being, um, you know, overstressed and overburdened, it actually brings this sense of people's difference into the room, the different voices, the different accents, the, some, some very confident, some very tentative, some people who choose to look at the person next to them because they don't feel like speaking that, that night. Um, and as it says in this, in this note, um, I'm not even sure it is a curatorial project, but seeing as my background is, is with curating and public programming, I would say that it's the, the real curation is of the creation of an atmosphere prompted by collective exploration, exchange, and subjective awakenings, um, rather than the presentation of artworks. So here are the unwritten rules that we've developed. We, we really try to stay with the text. We really, when people go off and become too abstract, we say, you know, where are you seeing that? Can we go back to that bit of writing? And that has a way of kind of grounding us. And I think it's a way of um, being somewhat inclusive for people who, you know, who don't have that academic background or that political background. Here are some of the the kind of key tenets, I would say, some of the key concepts that have um, under, underscored the group, some of them I've already mentioned. Um, emotional and socially reproductive labor, 
being something that we talk about a lot. Um, it's local and situated. We're really interested in specific feminisms for specific moments. We, we totally get there's not just one feminism. Um, and then it can, you know, in some of our discussions where we've looked at, let's say, feminisms from an Islamic context or some sessions around Kurdish feminisms, you know, those, those, those situations are very different to, you know, mine as a middle class white woman. So we're trying to also challenge our own idea of feminism, kind of decenter it, look at our, our own inheritances and, and the kind of exclusions that our, our feminisms or my feminisms have led me to. A very important text for us has been White Woman Listen. We've, we've read that a couple of times because there Hazel C. Carby is, is really pointing out how, how white women have a sort of assumption about a universal womanhood and um, connects um, with the earlier paper, really, that um, really kind of invisibilizes um, the sort of the difference of ethnicity. We understand feminisms in the, in the plural, and we understand feminism as a radical and critical tool, and it's certainly not just about women or woman, however you seek, to, however you want to spell that. So we have regular meetings. As I said, we read out loud. Um, we emphasize that it's not about um, knowledge. It's a place to be vulnerable and to actually accept how little we do know. And so I think that can empower members of the group to say, look, I really do want to learn about Kurdish feminisms. Let's invite somebody in from that movement. Let's look at some texts. Let's not be smug about what we know. Or sort of um, embarrassed about what we don't know. Let's sort of invite other voices in. Um, there's a sense of um, the politics of citation really mattering, that you know, not just who we quote and who we reference, all those things are, are massively important, but also kind of where we put our energy. So it's a kind of what I call an, a form of embodied citation. Um, this, there's a, a really lovely MA thesis that a member of the group called Julia has written. She hasn't actually had it examined yet, so I'm a little bit cheeky. She sent it to me. <laughs> she better get an A. Um, but she rather beautifully wrote down some of the key um, processes because this group did emerge just through process. It wasn't something I set out to do for four or five years. Um, but I think what she underlines in her thesis is that there's a degree of protocol. And um, she quotes from Joe Freeman's The Tyranny of Structurelessness, which points out the kind of myth of the structure-free feminist group. All groups have um, protocols, they have um, methodologies, and it's, um, you know, we try to not make them too constraining, but we do have certain methods, and there is a certain kind of etiquette to the group. Um, another member, and this is in a conversation that we, that I edited between regulars, talks about how it's sort of large and shifting, diffuse enough to never feel like a clique. Um, and that in a way, I mean, at certain moments, some people who come regularly say, oh, we should be a collective, you know, we should be much more um, public. And actually, there's something about it being quite a loose group that you don't have to come every month. You can just show up and read and get something um, that actually, I think, gives it a kind of an openness, uh, a flexibility that is valued. It's not about a high-level productivity either, which I think many of us feel quite grateful for. Um, another Julia talks about um, the media, yes, using the text as a medium through which to get to know one another and challenge one another's positions. And one of the things I really value about the group is how intergenerational it is. In the group that went to Milan, the youngest person had just done her BA and the oldest is about to retire. So we are genuinely intergenerational. Um, and actually, I really like what Sarah says in this text at the end, where she talks about this thing of going across London, this excitement, knowing she was going to be encountering other feminists. But she says, um, I find it meaningful to read aloud while people listen. It seems like a little thing, but it's rare that women's voices are heard so attentively and with care. So a bunch of us were just in Milan. There are some amazing feminist exhibitions there at the moment, actually. Um, the Unexpected Subject, which is a not brilliant, but still great to see exhibition of predominantly Italian uh, second wave feminist art 
organized by Flash Art. There is an amazing exhibition of Marinella Pirelli, who is a very underknown figure, largely because she withdrew her work from circulation, and it's only recently been reintroduced. Um, but we agreed that one of the problems with the exhibitionary format was that it can have a stultifying effect on material art, writing, political organizing that comes from social movements or is very inspired by social movements. And in the museum, it can feel quite dead. And we, again, I think talked about how the sort of making these movements alive through our coming together and reading aloud um, has a way of kind of, yeah, making them present in the present. We spent an evening at the Libreria della Donna in Milan, which is, um, has been going since 1975. And they still, they, they meet, I, I don't know if it's every Saturday night, certainly regularly, to have these extremely well-attended sessions where they're thrashing out feminisms. Um, this talk was on prostitution. I have a feeling my Italian is really bad. I have a feeling a lot of what was said was perhaps by some standards a little old-fashioned. They were talking about abolishing sex work and abolishing pornography. Um, but they really listened to each other. Nobody was on their phones. There were men there listening attentively. And the figure on the far right with the gray hair, that's Louisa Moraro. She set up the Good Bookshop in 1975. And she was arguing and intervening and acting as almost a bit like a mother superior, kind of pointing out where she thought arguments fell short. And when I chatted over dinner afterwards, there was a sort of very delicious five-course meal to which we were invited when I was talking to some women there about why the, why the libraria had continued for so long. They said that it was partly to do with Luisa Moraro and her partner, Lea Cigarini, that they come, they listen, and they argue. And it's a really, it's a very critical space. So being a feminist in this Milanese context is not about agreeing with each other or just being nice to each other. It's also about taking the time to disagree and taking the time to kind of really work through your differences. Um, so here's the bookshop. Uh, this is from a, this brilliant book, The Collective Wrote Together. It was translated in 1990, where they talk about um, it was an unusual way of doing politics, which revealed to many women that the system of social relationships could be changed, not in the abstract, as, of, as we had all learnt was possible, but in the concrete, inventing new ways to spend our own energy. So in a kind of very sort of modest level, I think, I hope, that this is what this reading group does. The fact that many people who lead different sessions, five minutes, thank you, that should be doable, um, you know, are maybe studying, they probably haven't led a public event before, but through having some guidance from me and other members of the group and the knowledge that there will be regular um, reading group attenders present when they lead their session, they get a kind of confidence to take that step. And as I said before, to open themselves up to feminisms that they have not encountered through their studies or through their independent reading. Um, we had a great day with the women from the University delle Donne. This is um, in the kind of yeah free university um, spirit. They have small meetings throughout the city and a HQ where they they sell books and also produce a lot of their own books. Um, so yeah, here again through the as yet unexamined MA thesis of Julia Antonioli, um, she was sort of, I think, very helpfully really spending time thinking about why, why this reading group has relevance for her and what she thinks it can offer curating and it's something around spending time together, something around not, not just making a tokenist effort to, you know, represent an underrepresented um, group movement or identity, but making a kind of real concerted commitment. And something about learning together, um, which I think, you know, museums want to see themselves as educational spaces, but sometimes their way of educating can be a bit sterile. Um, 
And here I think I'll just end with a few more things that um, regular participants of the group have said that sort of, I think, again, provide some insights that as someone who has organized a lot of exhibitions and has mainly worked in uh, um, public art um, centers and galleries where the major emphasis was on presentation and something that an audience could kind of come along to and then leave. This form of working on a more consistent level with um, some of the same people or people who kind of flow in and out of the group but know it's there. I think I've learned I've learned something about perhaps how to um, how to to curate differently. So. Erin talks about slowing it, slowing down and hearing in the, in the company of others. Um, Diana talks about um, a space of encounter with diverse voices. Amy reflects on the importance of them being free and non-productive at a moment when higher education is expensive and compromised by marketization. Um, actually, the final thing I will add in my last minute um, is however I think valuable groups like this are and there are quite a few others the Women of Colour Index Reading Group which is organised out of the archive at the Women's Art Library at, at Goldsmiths where I teach is another um, fantastic initiative but in this same conversation Laura worries She's, she, she worries about um, how groups like this can can be exploited. And I think we've heard that critique um, of some institutions in the UK, such as Tate, where through their Tate exchange, you know, they make this gesture of, we want to hear different voices, we want to work with different groups, but those groups, um, I think, often question what's in it for them, apart from a, some institutional validation and branding. Is the institution actually exploiting all this energy, all this work, all this creativity, and are they actually doing their bit in turn to recognize and repay? Thank you.